On this episode, I'm joined by filmmaker Jason Horton. Jason is responsible for such films as Monsters in the Woods, Trap, and his latest film, Craving. Jason also has a YouTube channel titled J. Horton, where he has many videos that cover various topics about filmmaking, crowdfunding, and how to be a successful filmmaker and make money at it. Jason and I discuss a host of topics in this episode from Indiegogo campaigns and financing, getting talent, and even overcoming various obstacles you'll face as an independent filmmaker. Jason is an extremely talented teacher, and if you are new to filmmaking, do not miss this episode. So without further ado, here's my interview with filmmaker Jason Horton. All right, we are live. Jason, how's it going, man? It's going really good, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate you coming on. It's, uh, it's, I'm, I'm really excited about this interview. Um, for those of you who don't know Jason, Jason is a very, very prolific filmmaker. You have, what, 40 films to your, to your credit right now? I mean, I've, I've produced over, I think, 60 or 65. Um, I've directed about 25, and I've edited probably 50 or so. Wow. That's, that's, that's an incredible resume. That's an absolutely yeah. incredible resume. So we're, we're really excited to talk to you, man. And, I, and I'm hoping my audience today can, can learn a lot from you. Um, so let's, let's get started with some background about you. Where, where were you born? I was born in uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, it's a little north of uh, the capital. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Indianapolis. Oh, my gosh. Indianapolis. I could remember okay. the capital of Indiana. Yeah. But, yeah, a little south of Chicago, a little, little north of Indianapolis. What was it like growing up there? I'm Midwest, you know, it's a safe place to grow up. It was actually a, a, like a good place to grow up, you know, but after you, you know, when you hit about 17, 18, doesn't have a lot to offer, like, you know, an 18 to like 28 year old. So, you know, I, I, I got out, I, th I think I was about 23 or four when I moved um, and I went to, went to college. I was kind of a late starter. I was a little, little bit of a hoodlum uh, in my like 18 to 21, you know. Uh, Where'd you go to school? <laughs> what was that? Oh you, oh, you know what? Let's go back to You said you were in a band? Yes. Yes. I was the, uh, so I was in like choir and stuff when I was a kid, show choir and all that. And, you know, we were friends with the people in band. And so we ended up starting a rock band with some friends, a funk rock band called Smack Dab. And I was the lead singer for it. And I did that for like, I think I was like 22 when they kicked me out of there. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's do you, now, do you play any instruments or do you just sing? You know, I just sing. I, I, I've, I've tried to learn guitar probably half a dozen times, but given up almost every time. I just don't have the dexterity. One of the, one of the things, like, I was never really good at sports, which is also why I kind of got into movies. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I was very small for my age. I'm still not a large man, but I was like, I was a tiny, like, you know, high school, middle school kid. Um, you know, couldn't and just wasn't good at sports or football or, you know, anything. And uh, so like movies and, you know, TV, that was my, you know, kind of what I immersed myself in. Gotcha. No, you're, you're, what do your parents do? Uh, are they retired or do they still work? Um, well, uh, my, my mom, I was pretty much uh, raised by a single mother. Uh, uh, my father, I never really met him. Um, he, he died when I was like 12. Um, so my mom uh, owned her own uh, house cleaning business. Um, she was a uh, like Montgomery Ward salesperson before that, um, but she's always been a just you know, really strong, you know, independent woman, raising her kid. You know, you know, just me and her. It was, it was like we we had a really good uh, relationship. Was she was she pretty into film that you remember? Um, yes, but but like purely has a has a fan. You know, like uh, like we did a lot of our our bonding over movies. Like uh, to this day, when people ask me like my top five movies, like The World According to Garp, uh, the Robin Williams movie is somewhere in there, and it's mostly because of you know it's just a movie that we both really bonded strongly over when I was very young. Like, you know, I want to say like eight or nine, something like that, and uh, we always come back to it. But as I got older and my taste started becoming more, you know, like horror and more like edgy stuff, we, you know, our, our filmmaking taste diverged. <laughs> yeah, there's this <laughs> divergence there. <laughs> yeah. The very, the very last movie she ever took me to a theater to see was uh, Friday the 13th 4. And she asked like several times during the movie to leave. And I just, I wouldn't leave. And uh, so we watched it. And as we're walking out, she says, that's the last, that is the last time I'm ever going to the movies. I don't think she ever went to the movies again after that. Wow. Like she, you know, she'd watch them at home, you know, VHS and whatnot, but she would not go to the movies. Friday the 13th killed it for her. 
I mean, what, what, what <laughs> or, or maybe was it was that? Predator. It might have been Predator. It was it was Predator or Friday the Thirteenth. I can't remember which. <laughs> I can definitely see Predator doing it. That was that was an interesting yeah. film for its time. Yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's so. Let's let's talk about TV for a second. Growing up, what what were your TV shows that you were into? Um, you know, when I was young, I was super into the Dukes of Hazard, uh, Incredible Hulk, um, like all the '80s stuff, uh, uh, Knight Rider. Um, you know, I, I was never a huge, huge cartoon person, but like I did watch them, but it was like more of the like, like boy toy cartoons, you know, like GI Joe and stuff like that. Um, but, uh, gosh, uh, Dal- I like my mom liked Dallas. So like I had an affinity for Dallas, the original, um, <laughs> uh, geez, uh, I, I, that's, I can't really remember. That's about it. Yeah. So, um, where where did you go to school? Where'd you go to high school? Uh, I was uh, North Side High School. It was in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Um, it was it's like like Fort Wayne. Whenever you say Indiana, people think like you know you know corn stalks and like a podunk town. But like Fort Wayne's a pretty like it's a major city. Like not like mm-hmm. you know it's not New York or L.A. But you know it's like uh, I forget what the population is, but it's you know upper six figures. Right. You know so um, you know like my high school was one of. I think we had five or six high schools in the city and, you know, each high school had, you know, between, you know, 200 and like a thousand students. And I, I think our high school was like 400 students. So it was, it was a big, you know, immersive experience. And like I said, I was in a uh, choir, like show choir. And, you know, we, we would go to like Japan in the summers and well, one summer and stuff like that. So it, it was like t- typical high school stuff. Did, did you like high school or did you hate it? Um, so I, I, I guess I hated it. Um, I, I, looking back, I hated it when I was in it, looking back at it, I'm like, man, that was a great time. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> like, yeah. like, like I wasn't, you know, I, maybe I just, I wasn't as popular as I wanted to be. Like, you know, I was like one of the, you always want more than what you have. And like, I, you know, I always wanted to be like the whatever, like football star guy, popular homecoming queen, you know, but I had friends. I had a lot of friends and we went out every weekend. We just weren't at the quote unquote cool parties, but, but it was, man, it was, you know, no responsibilities, you know, like we, we were not wealthy people, but you know, my mom worked very hard, you know, like we're, we were never starving, you know what I mean? Like I, like I always had what I needed, you know, and, and my last year of high school, which was pretty awesome. My mom, uh, reconnected with, uh, who became my stepdad. She was like, she was her first husband and then became her last husband. And, uh, they, uh, they got married when I was, uh, seven, it was my senior year. I was either 17 or 18 and she basically moved in with him, but didn't sell the house for a year. So for like my entire senior year of high school, I was like on my own in that house, you know? So like I, I was, I was pretty popular with my, my group of friends. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I totally get that sentiment. I, I actually, it's, it's funny you talk about that. Cause I, <laughs> I, I, I recalled my mom, I think it was about two weeks ago. I had, um, there's a, there's a school down the street from my house and I, and I'm sometimes when I'm coming home, um, from lunch, the kids will be out playing and I, I come home. I said, you know, mom, <laughs> I was, I really wish I knew then what I know now, because I had no, like at, at that time in your life, high school is the, the pinnacle of your universe. It's the center of everything. It's nothing is more important than that. And then, you know, 20 years later, you look back and it's just like, oh my gosh, I had nothing to worry about. I had no bills. Nothing. I had no responsibilities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, for, for me, a few years later, like I said, I went to college, uh, I was 24, you know, when I started college, but man, my college years were incredible. I mean, like, I think that's where I really kind of came into my own. That's where I really started actually studying film, you know, um, like making friendships that have lasted me 20 years now. Yeah. Um, I was like, you know, I, it just, it, the world opened up to me when I, when I went away to, to college. Where, where'd you go to college? Uh, UNO, the University of New Orleans. I have, uh, I have some family, some like extended family that lives down the bayou there, like in the, like Lafourche Parish. And they, uh, <laughs> so my, I, I was kind of a screw up before that. My, my brother knew I was like thinking about, you know, getting my head straight and like maybe going back to school. So he offered, he worked offshore there and he got me a job working on a utility boat. So like I was a deck hand and then a relief engineer in the Gulf of Mexico for like a year and a half. And that, you know, like 
I, I, I feel it's almost a disservice to call it like military because you know disservice to the military, but but right. in, in a way it was like a military for me. You know, like it was where I I had to like I had to fend for myself. I had to make food and clean up and you know do do all the duties on the boat and clean the engine. Like I wasn't very mechanical, but like I had to learn how to change oil and like maintain this big giant boat engine. You know, it was it was like it was a very good experience. Would you say it's probably the most unique job you've had? Um, pro- yeah, then it's the one people are most surprised about. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But I mean, it was great. Like I said, I was a little bit of a screw up, and it really it isolated me, and it got me, you know, a lot of time to think. Like you set up, I, you know, I was working a midnight shift for a while, like uh, midnight to noon, and so from like like 2 a.m. to like 5 a.m., like on a utility boat, it's just, it is dead. Like I'm the only person up moving around and you could like, you could go and like lay up on the top of the boat and just like look at the stars and stuff. And I never did things like that when I was a kid, you know? So it was like, it was almost like without understanding what mindfulness was, I I was practicing mindfulness, (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, it was was good. And, and, And it's where I like seriously started writing. I, I, like, I wouldn't say the scripts in that time were good, but it's where I started, like, actually putting pen to paper and writing out scripts. Do you, do you still have some of that stuff to, today? You know, I wish I did. I, I had, so I was writing everything out by longhand at the time, and I used to write them in spiral notebooks, and I had, like, 10 of them. And I used to move them from place to place. Uh, when I was in, uh, I was living in Louisiana after school, uh, right before Katrina. And, you know, we had evacuated, but we, we didn't think it was going to be what it was. So, of course, we left everything and like I lost a lot of stuff. So that that was some of the things that got lost. Oh, that's a, that's a bummer. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I you know, nobody I know was was killed or anything. You know, I, I lost some stuff, you know. Yeah, I, I actually uh, do you remember back in 2010, the uh, the Nashville flood that occurred in 2010? Mm hmm. Um, I don't, I don't. <laughs> no, that's right. There's a, I, I, I can kind of second. Like I'm going to close this door. Sorry. Yeah, sure, sure. I'm house setting for some friends and their dogs are very barky. Ugh. Oh, those the two little white ones from Facebook? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> little monsters. No, I'm just kidding. They're really sweet dogs, but yeah. <laughs> one of them looks like a troublemaker. The one that was staring at the camera. Yeah, in the yeah, picture, yeah. I'm like, that's the troublemaker right there. She is the one with, uh, they're, yeah. Yeah. And they you know, like and you know, they look very identical, but you really get to know them after a couple of days. So now I know I know which one's which and like you know, I walk them at the same time and one of them's difficult to walk and you guessed which one. <laughs> but yeah. But I you know, I really like dogs, so it's a cool it's a cool uh it's a cool little break. Yeah, dogs dogs are pretty amazing. I um I, I back in twenty ten there was a there was a flood in Nashville. Um and my my family and I we got displaced for about six months. It's that's a that's a horrible experience. It's, yeah. it's something that nobody understands. I mean, just the I remember staying on the porch with my grandparents and just yelling for help, you know. And I think the thing that I felt the most guilty about was I was yelling because my grandfather's diabetic. Mm. And, and my grandmother couldn't stand for long periods of time. And the water just kept coming up further and further onto the porch. And, I, you know, I, I felt so guilty about yelling over my neighbors for help. But I was thinking about my grandparents, you know. And I actually went and apologized to one of them afterward. You know, and he's like, no, I totally understand. But, yeah, I, I, I can – it wasn't nearly as bad as Katrina. So I don't I don't want to draw too much of a oh, parallel no, there. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. No, that, but, that's stuff. And, like, I, I, I can't even – like I said, you know, I just – I lost some stuff. And, like, I didn't have – you know, like I didn't have family I was caring for down there. I was a single guy. I had some stuff. I lived in an apartment. You know, I, I ended up losing a car, a camera, and, you know, some clothes and papers. And, you know, it was, I, I was going to move to Los Angeles the year after anyway. It kind of just moved my timetable up a little bit. So it really wasn't like I always feel even weird mentioning Katrina because it, it really it didn't affect me nearly as bad as it did some people. You know, like it's I was definitely a, a surreal. It's, it's a surreal experience, though. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. And I, I, I have a friend that stayed there like through the whole thing. They were living in one of the like high rise hotels that was like you know whatever weatherproofed, and it ended up being the hotel where a lot of the media stayed. Like when they were doing all the coverage of the Superdome and all that, they were there for I think three or four weeks afterwards. And uh, he had his camera. He ended up making a documentary out of it called Refuge: A Last Resort, which uh, I, I, I uh, distribute now. It's it's interesting how much 
how much of an influence just real life itself can can have on on a film. You know, I mean, even Absolutely. something like a horror film. You know, or or even or even the impact you know films have on you. Because I, you know, case in point, um, the the day after my mom and I drove down to the subdivision. And, you know, it, it basically the entrance was a shore at that point because there was just so much water. And uh, I get, we got in a boat and this guy took us to the house to get some stuff. And I remember there was a helicopter flying around and all I kept thinking about, and this is going to sound so random, but I kept thinking about the end of Night of the, the 1968 Night of the Living Dead and the <laughs> yeah. helicopters flying around. I kept thinking, it, for some reason, that experience, I kept thinking about that scene in the movie with those yeah. helicopters coming in and that that music. And, and, and I don't know why, but I mean, to this day, all these years later that's that that's what sticks out the most to me is i just kept thinking like wow man this, there's something about this that reminds me of night of the living dead and this helicopters flying around this guy's hanging out with a camera and just you know to be front and center like that in a disaster you know it's just it's interesting how film can kind of have that kind of impact on you totally. um so let me ask you this what's the first horror film you remember seeing like what impact did it have on you so the first thing that I, I and I'm sure there were ones before this, but the the thing that sticks out to me, I would, like I was very young. I want to say like three or four, like just barely old enough to remember stuff. I remember watching The Exorcist on TV. So like an edited for TV version, little like you know like till ten or twelve inch black and white TV watching mm-hmm. the. And I, I remember not being able to make it through. Like I was so scared, you know, turned it off. <laughs> but well, uh, even the edited version, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, at least that's that that that's what I that's what I remember. I, um, the the first thing I remember at the theater when I was a little bit older, I want to say like ten or eleven. My brother, I, well, my half brother, um, he took me to see a midnight showing of the seventy eight Dawn of the Dead. Oh and my gosh. That that's the one that really like, okay, I'm into horror movies. You know what I mean? Like before then, and, and even now, you know, like I make a lot of horror movies. I started in horror, I go back to horror a lot, but my, my tastes are very broad. Like I like oh, everybody says they like all kinds of stuff, but I really like all kinds of stuff. Like I, I really don't have a, a favorite genre as a viewer. You know, so, you know, I was just into movies, you know, but when Dawn of the Dead came in, it got me on this horror kick that lasted pretty much through my teens where I would just say, I'm a horror fan. Like, you know, I don't like anything. I do. I'm a horror guy. You know, I was still watching other stuff. But if you asked me when I was 17 or 18, it was like just horror. And Dawn of the Dead's what kicked that off. I'm so, I'm so jealous. That is my favorite. Of, of all the films I've ever seen to this day, Dawn of the Dead is still at the top of my list. I, I wish I could go back in time and watch oh, yeah. that in theaters. Such a, the thing that's so cool about the Dawn, the original anyway, and even night and day is like, they really, really create a world like that, mm-hmm. that you like. And, and when you're a young, when you're a young boy, you know, you're picturing yourself in that world, you mm-hmm. know? So like, yeah, like, you know, you picture yourself in the, you know, in the mall or, you know, even before like getting to the mall and like, what, what would I have done? You know? <laughs> Have you met Have you met any of the cast at all? No, no. I, that's one thing. That's kind of a hole in my like uh, fandom thing. I've, I've really, I've never really done conventions or, um, uh, and I've never fan like like fanned out that much. I, I aside from working with them, I, I really haven't met that many celebrities. I met. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet Ken Forey back in 2015. Mm-hmm. He's, he's he's a really really nice guy i'd like to meet him again i, I met him actually i met him and tony todd at the same convention in nashville oh cool um, i'd say it'd be interesting if you got to meet. have you met linda did you ever meet linda blair no no i think it'd be interesting like to have the experience you had with the exorcist and then to actually meet linda blair just to get oh, that yeah. parallel of like here's the real human being versus <laughs> like, the experience you had as a child I, I i wonder what life was like for her after doing that movie because she played such a terrifying character you know and, and like some people portray characters so well you almost you sort of project that image on them like in, in real life you know so I just, I just wonder what life was like for her after that for a while right that's crazy um okay so um Let's talk about your, your foray into, to filmmaking. Um, okay. what, so did you, did you mess around with film as a child or was, was film school kind of the first time you really picked up a camera and started doing anything? No, like a, like a lot of, you know, like, uh, filmmakers, you know, I, I you know, I got a video camera when I was, I, I think it was for my 12th birthday. So like I was making little things, but I, I never, 
it wasn't until actually it wasn't until college that I actually saw filmmaking as something that you could maybe potentially do and make money with. You know what I mean? So like I did make little stuff like I got the little camera and I would get my my cousins and my little niece together and I would shoot these almost like basically like staged plays it looked like a woody allen movie you know there'd just be like Mm -hmm. a wide shot and they'd come in and out and it would be all edited in camera you know when i discovered uh evil dead i made a like a possessed dog movie with our little dachshund that i had forever oh god i wish i still had that it was it was i i remember it being super cute my mom loved it but um i remember uh, a few years later me and my mom got in a tiff and uh i remember destroying the videotape like out of spite and, and to this day it's been one of my great regrets but anyway but yeah I, I i made a few things but it wasn't really until film school that i really kind of started putting it together like if you would ask people in high school people would say oh yeah jason's going to be a filmmaker but i never really had any concrete yeah. avenue to to go there you know yeah. So that that er, that's early. The stuff you did early on. Uh, how did you edit it? Was it like on on camera editing, or did you have yeah, like a... it was all like with the video camera? It was all in camera. Like uh, you know, just hitting start and hitting stop on the record. Like no no you know tape to tape or nothing like that. The only thing I do sometimes is I discovered how to do the audio video dub. So I could you know I could dub over top of the tape and I could either overdub video or new audio. So I would play with that a little bit. But for the most part, it was just stop and start. And if you messed up a take like late in the movie, you just had to start all over again. <laughs> so what? So what was film school like for you? Well, let me actually let me back. Let me ask you this just just for the audience. Uh, what years were you in film school? Um, 99 to 2003. I mean, and basically, you know, I say film school, but University of New Orleans, it's a, you know, it's, it's a, it's a university. Like they have a film program, but like, you can't really even like major in film. My major was communications and I just took some film classes, you know, but, um, so, but yeah, it was, it was just, it was regular college, you know, but they had, they had a, a good film program. And, you know, it was like starting to become known nationwide. They had a really good teacher. There was lots of has a going there as opposed to going to like UCLA or something. It's like you get hands on stuff like very early because, you know, it's not this big, you know, competitive, you know, arena. You would just go in even as a freshman, you know, like you could you could direct shorts or edit or, you know, whatever you wanted to do. And, and, and you know, I, I've found, you know, th- throughout my you know filmmaking career is like experience is always i i it's it's always experience is all always trumps you know like education i i guess that that sounds a little bad because i i don't i don't i don't regret my college time because like it really this is going to sound really uh you know heady but you know like college teaches you like how, how to think and how to problem solve like it's not necessarily mm-hmm. about learning your craft as much as it is how to attack problems in different ways Like, you know, like a lot of the skills that I learned learning how to do, you know, Spanish class helped me attack filmmaking problems now, just not directly. You know what I mean? Yeah, that makes sense. So so at at that time period, had had digital filmmaking started to kind of come into the education program or is everything still very much film based and steam baked machines, things like that? So in at UNO, everything was still pretty much film based. Like uh, I think we shot on eight millimeter and sixteen. Although we weren't like editing flatbed, they would digitize it and then we would edit in like Premiere. I think it was Premiere we were editing in. And uh, but so like and the uh, the uh, like the Canon was it the XL one had come out like somewhere right around there, and uh, and then the Panasonic uh, DVX. Uh, something i forget the first uh mini dv consumer camera to shoot 24 frames a second it came out around there too and this was also right around the time uh 28 days later came out and there was all this like you know buzz about oh digital movies and they can be so cheap and you know so that was like as i was graduating college was when like i think the dvx had been out for like two years at that time and that's that's really what gave me the the you know the tools to be able to shoot a first movie and I, I we shot it on that that dvx so as an experienced filmmaker looking back 
I, I feel like the consensus amongst of the, of the people I've talked to, of the directors I've had the opportunity to speak with, most of them will tell you that film school is not necessary. They say just get out there and start making stuff. Like what, what is your take on that? So I, I agree with it, but I, I go back to like what I said earlier and a lot of the, a lot of the problem solving tools that I have now as an adult that I use to cope every day can, and, and a lot of my interpersonal, like being able to deal with people and manage people like that came from college for me. Now, do you necessarily have to go over to college for that? Probably not. Um, and then another plus for film school, it's honestly like it's your first foray, foray into networking. And like, I mean, I only I'm only still in contact with maybe three or four people, you know, from my film school days. But, you know, like if I would have went to uh, full sail down in Florida or, you know, you know, one of the schools in L.A. or UCLA or whatnot, that there's people that like they make their careers from the networking that they do in those colleges. But if you're not in a higher end college or, you know, you're, you know, podunk, you know, somewhere in Colorado, probably not. That makes sense. Yeah. So, so you finished film school, you're, you're out in the world, you're ready to start making films. Like what, what was the first film that you worked on? That, that was your film. This was your baby. Yeah. So my, my senior year of college, uh, we just, me and a couple of friends decided we're going to make our first feature that summer. And, uh, and, and we just did, um, you know, like I was working at Starbucks at the time. Um, I saved up a few grand. Um, uh, another one of my partners, he had some credit cards. He put a couple on that and, uh, we got a little bit of money from a, uh, uh, video production company that we were working for. And we just, I think we spent a little under $5,000 and just, we just went and did it. And, and, and honestly, for going to film school for four years, we, we really didn't know much. I mean, cause again, you learn a lot of technical stuff in school, but like we didn't learn anything about screenwriting or, you know, and we couldn't, didn't really hire writers. So we just wrote it and none of us were really writers at the time. And, uh, I, I actually, I think that first script was, uh, it's called rise of the undead. Um, and it was, uh, I think it was like, I want to say it was like 70 pages. You know, and it wasn't even typed in a in a screenwriting program. It was like we typed it out in Word or something. Like it wasn't even formatted correctly. We just we just we just did it. You know, and then so you know we did that movie, and then you know just just luck, you know, or, or perseverance, whichever you prefer. You know, we found a distributor to take it. Uh, they put it out. It got out all over. We didn't really make any money off it, but it was released. And, you know, so I'm looking at it a year later and I'm like, well, you know, why, why isn't it so good? <laughs> why isn't it good? And, and, you know, and then it hit me. It was, I, I mean, there are a lot of, there's a lot of reasons, but I the chief one was, you know, it, it just, it wasn't well written. It was just, it was a script we threw together to have something to make. You know? And then I Where, started taking my writing much more seriously after that. So would you say from the experience, the big takeaways were the importance of the writing and, the, and like, what, what were the biggest lessons you learned from that first film? Yeah. The, 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 the biggest one is the importance of writing and story. Like, uh, you know, I think there, and to this day, I think this exists with filmmakers that, you know, there's this misconception that if you build it, they will come, you know, like if I make this thing, like, it, like, it's just like by default going to be watchable or good. And, and it's not like writing is a huge, like, difficult uh, craft and task and if you're and if you're not committed to that in the same way you are the filmmaking it's it's not going to be good you know I, you can maybe get lucky but you know like like you know i always look at some of the independent stuff that blew up in the in the 90s like you know like kevin and, you know whether you're a fan of kevin smith or not you know like clerks is not a well directed movie you know like it's not like good performances it's not good shots you know i mean it looks like crap but he he was such an engaging writer that it transcended that you know or you know, um i'm trying to think of another example um allison anders you know there, there were a lot of directors that they they weren't like these like great visual stylists but they wrote really engaging stories yeah, and, and I think some of that too is is their products of their time. You know, I, I think a, a movie like a Clark's is a fantastic film, but I don't think it would work today. You know, I think had it been done at any other time, it might not have worked. But because it was nineteen, I think it was ninety four. Yeah. Um, because it was nineteen ninety four, it, it just it worked. You know, the culture of the time just really saturated that film. So, so you you have Rise of the Undead. You get some distribution for it. What what came next for you? 
Um, well, um, when that came out right before Katrina and then Katrina happened and I moved to LA, um, and then I was under the misconception that because I had directed a movie that had like, you know, worldwide distribution, it was like, like LA would just be like, yeah, come and direct our movie. <laughs> Dude, I couldn't, I couldn't get a job as a PA, like nothing, you know, like I, I was in LA for probably three months before, like, I was just totally out of money. I had to go back working at Starbucks again. Um, and it took probably another six months from there before I got my first industry job, which was an assistant editor on a movie called Butcher House. It's this horrible, low budget horror movie. Um, but through some of the connections I made there, like uh, one of the EPs, like I hit it off with and they were producing this like uh, like two million dollar, like uh, religious movie about like a black Jesus. And the director of that, I hit it off with, and I started uh, editing and uh, shooting movies for him. You know, so and I did a lot of those. And then from that, you know, I just kept getting other jobs. And somewhere in there, I did a camera gig um, for a documentary, like a comedy documentary. And I was talking to the producer, and he was really wanting to get into, like, low budget, like, you know, like horror movie uh, producing and he asked if I had any zombie scripts and I didn't but I was like I could write one real quick and so I did and that became Edges of Darkness and he put like I think 25,000 into it wow that was and so that was my second uh directorial thing no then, what okay oh I'm sorry I didn't mean to interrupt no, no, you. What, so what what is it like going from a five thousand dollar film to suddenly you're handed the reins of a $25,000 film. What, what was that initial experience like? Right. Well, so, so honestly, it's, it wasn't a whole hell of a lot different because, you know, in, in Louisiana, when we were shooting that first movie, we had so many film school friends that just worked on it. We had a full crew. Like if, if everybody would have been getting paid on that, that, that would have been probably a $90,000 movie. You know, so like we had the crew and we had lights and, you know, we, like we had stuff. We had a, I think we shot over the course of like 12 days, which isn't a huge <laughs> schedule, but pretty good for $5,000. So Edges of Darkness was actually kind of a smaller crew and uh, and, and less days. Um, but, you know, it, it was still, you know, I, like I had learned more. It's definitely a much better movie, um, but but it wasn't a whole hell, it wasn't a whole hell lot of difference. It's still it's still the same the same challenges just the different yeah, budget, so, essentially. I mean, you know, it's, it, it's, it's still kind of guerrilla like you're still like you know you're still shooting in Los Angeles without permits you know you're still you know non union you know you're you're paying people you know one hundred twenty five dollars a day it's you know it's still like you know you still feel like you're just everybody's doing you a favor you know so like, just get it done. Do you, do you think it's it's. Uh... I almost wonder, is is it scarier working with a bigger budget than it is working on a smaller budget film? It is for me because uh, the like I to to a fault, I really like care about other people and like the other people's investment. And, and here's the thing about people that invest in movies at this level. They're usually not rich, you know, because like a like a rich person that's really investment savvy they're not going to put $25,000 into a movie and not just because it's a movie, but because there's, it, there's a ceiling on how much a $25,000 movie is going to make unless, unless you win the lottery, you know, right. and, uh, and you, you have know, clerks, clerks or whatever, or, yeah. you know, a mariachi or whatever it is, which is, you know, like I said, it's lightning strikes, that's lottery wins. But for the most part, if you're an investor and you're looking to invest a movie, 25000 is not a very exciting investment because, you know, like at, at best, you know, you're you're looking at maybe double, triple it. But if, you know, if, if you're wealthy, that's not like that's not an exciting investment. That's kind of like, mm. you know, I mean, and at that level, you're also not going to be working with like big stars like you, you might get like one B level or C level guy or, or gal, but it's not going to be. Like that, that's why raising money for ultra low budget films is so hard, because like I said, most savvy investors will, will not want to invest one because investing in film is about the worst investment a person can make, period. And two, on, you know, a lower budget movie, there, there's only so much they're going to return, you know, yeah. so it, it's it, it, that's what makes it hard. You know, so usually the people that are investing in those movies at that level 
there are people that are not too far off from me and you that like they had a good year or they had a good income tax return or, you know, I had a movie a couple of years later where the dude that produced it, I come to find out later that like his mother had died and he had got some money from, you know, his mother's insurance and put like 15,000 into the movie, you know? So, and then if the movie doesn't perform this person that doesn't, doesn't probably won't have any extra money coming in for the rest of their life, just blew the only like, you know, big amount of money on this movie. And then are they going to get it back? And if they don't get it back, that freaking sucks. Yeah. You know, so that for, so for me, yeah, it's like, like, like making a 10 or $15,000 movie that I pay for. The only person I got to answer to is me, but say I make a 65, $75,000 movie and I have, you know, a couple multiple investors, even at maybe a few thousand dollars a piece, like that can be a major thing for them. I mean, I, I had a movie a few years ago that, you know, it, it failed. And I had several investors at the two and three thousand dollar level, and you know, there's a few of them that are really hurting now. You know, that could really use that money back, and the movie never made it. You know, so that I, to me, that that's the that's the scary part. That makes sense. I, I almost wondered though too if if people that do invest on that that level, if they're even expecting a return. You know, because I, I would almost and, I, and some don't, some don't. And, 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 and in that case, it's even, cause I, I have done some where, you know, it's been people that it's just, yeah, you know, I got, I got an extra five grand this year. Here you go. An extra 20. I mean, th there was one on that movie that failed. We had an investor an actually wealthy guy that came in at 25 K and, you know, he never got back a dime, but he didn't care. Yeah. Well, I won't say he didn't care, but he didn't, he didn't get bent out of shape. I get, yeah, I think for some people just they, they care, you know, they care about the arts, but also just to be a part of the movie making process, yeah. I, I think is, is something, I mean, to get an IMDb, I mean, you know, getting an IMDb credit today is, so, is, is such a right. big thing. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's why, and that's why certain like crowd funders, you know, like, like craving did, did so well, you know, and, and, and in the case of that, like, I, like, I don't feel bad about those because that is not, you know, it's not a traditional investment. That's somebody you know, that that's, that, I mean, they are basically, you know, paying to play, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. that, that, I, you know, like I said, I wouldn't want to make a career out of doing crowdfunding, but I, but I don't feel like morally, you know, questionable about it either. No, I, I understand. Cause I mean, they, they know what they're getting into with that, yeah, you know, totally. I, I, and, and they're, they, they are getting a return. I mean, like just, just looking at craving, I mean, you know, what was it? $24. You get a digital copy of the film. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, you yeah, special yeah. thanks. And you know, so you you still get a return from that as well. Yeah, um, you get something for your money. And some people really like like me. I I give to crowdfunders all the time, not just before craving. You know, it's something that I've done fairly regularly for the last decade. And I just support stuff when I want to help the filmmaker or that I think looks cool. I usually don't even care about perks. I like I, I, I bet you I've donated to probably two hundred campaigns, and I think I've probably selected a perk like three or four times. But, you know, oh, that, wow. that's just me. That's how I, how I go about it. Yeah. Cause I, well, I mean, you know, there really is a brotherhood of filmmakers. You know? totally. I mean, you really, you really want to support that art. Um, if you don't mind, I want to talk a little bit more about financing films. Um, sure. cause you, you, you've had the unique experience to get to sort of see both sides of the coin. And by that, I mean, you lived in the world of film when crowdfunding didn't exist and you mm -hmm. had to hit the pavement and find investors. You know, yep. and then today it's just as simple as, you know, throwing together a trailer, throwing together a promo video. Well, it, to be fair to you, it wasn't quite that simple for you because I watched your video really about how you did the, the fund. Yeah, yeah. You, you put a lot of work in your crowdfund. So I, I yeah. don't I don't want to take away from the effort you put in your crowdfund. And I, and I want you to talk about that yeah, uh, yeah. during our during our interview. Um, but so it. Yeah, because actually traditional fundraising is actually a little easier. <laughs> but yeah, go ahead. Is it really? I, I, Wait, I, I, that's a, that's kind of a, that's a really raw generalization, but we'll get into it. <laughs> well, so, so I want to know, so what, what, what was, how did you raise money for a film in, in 2005? Like, what did you do? So, so I'm just going to talk from my experience. And the thing is about this, because people ask, filmmakers ask this all the time. It's like one of their top questions, like, how do I find funding? And, and the thing is, and, and you'll and you'll see filmmakers out there that have like courses. This is how you do it. And, you know, even I've you know I've done videos like this is how you do it. But truth of the matter is, is it's it's such an individualized thing that like it's different for everybody. And I had an investor really early on, um, a mentor investor, and he told me 
that like because and he he invested in a lot of stuff. He's like he's like a like a lower level like venture capitalist. He invests in all kinds of startups and stuff. And he says he almost never invests in a thing. He invests in people. You know, so he was like, learn how to navigate people, learn how to ingratiate yourself with people, learn how to make people excited about what you're excited about, and they will invest in you. That's what he said. And I have found that to be true because the, the, so I've had um, one, two, three, four, five, six, I've had six movies that I've like self-produced that were, you know, financed by investors right mm-hmm. and on every single one of those except for one um i found the the bulk of the investments through people that i worked for or worked with on other movies so you know like i said i was uh, for edges of darkness i was shooting this comedy documentary and i'm sitting there talking to the ep and we just hit it off and we're just talking and, and this is over the course of a couple of weeks and, you know, during one of those conversations, you know, I mentioned that I'm a writer and, you know, and I never like hit him up or pitched him. I eventually just, you know, our friendship led to a point where he was like, hey, do you have this? And, you know, I didn't, but I created it and he invested in Edges of Darkness, but he didn't really invest in Edges of Darkness. He invested in, in me, you know, because like I, you know, and even at Edges of Darkness, I'd already made a $5,000 movie, even though it didn't make money, it was released everywhere. And at mm-hmm. that time, that was pretty impressive because, you know, just, you know, a kid off the street couldn't just go and upload to Amazon and, you know, get on Tubi and stuff like that like you can today. So, or, and YouTube wasn't really a thing then either. So, like, it was pretty impressive that, like, out of nowhere, these kids bootstrapped up a movie that didn't win any festivals, wasn't in festivals, wasn't nothing like that, just got distribution. So that made me attractive to investors at that level. Because at that time, if you could get if you could get distribution, like like that was a it was a big deal then, you know, especially for little tiny movies. And I, I've just I've always had, you know, I, I don't know if it was just I was good at picking the material or what, but I was just I was always good at finding distribution. Even even back then, you know, like I never did a movie that didn't get distributed. You know, so I, I think that was what made it my me attractive to investors. And then, you know, after Edges, um, I actually because I and I was still part time working at Starbucks uh, during this whole time. And uh, one of the baristas there, I you know met him. We, you know, we became friends, and he came into some money like maybe a year later. Not not like ton of money but he put five or six thousand dollars into trap which was my fourth movie or third movie and then you know and then you know and then kind of a same and then i'd met a producer back when i was in louisiana right after my first movie and just always stayed in touch with him yeah we're gonna find something to do together and then you know i I wrote monsters in the woods and i sent him that script he's like you know what I just had some money fall through from this other thing. I can put maybe 20 in. I can find another 10. We'll do Monsters in the Woods. And we did Monsters in the Woods. So it just, it was, it was like that, like, like all of them. And then, you know, the longer I worked in the business and was editing for other people, I mean, doing it, like editing is one of the best jobs you can get to move into other positions. Cause like you're mm-hmm. sitting there editing with the director, with the executive producers, with the money people, you know, and like, and I, I was always personable and I always ingratiated myself with them. And, you know, I just made connections and, you know, sometimes years later, those connections paid off and they helped finance another movie. So it sounds like it was, it's been a really grassroots experience at that point. Yeah, in time. totally. Like I've never, so like people ask about like pitch decks and stuff like that. I have never, ever in 60 films got something financed off a of pitch deck. Never, never once. I've I've had a few pitch decks made. I've showed pitch decks to some of these producers, but they they were in before that. That was just kind of like to get a general lay of the business plan. But like that's never been a thing for me. Um, whenever people always talk about oh pitch decks and you got to do this, I mean the pitch deck might might open a door, but I mean nine times out of ten, like it, it's networking, it's personal connections. Like they're investing in you. Like n- mm-hmm. nobody cares that you got the next great film because there's everybody out there is making the next great film. It's like, do they like you? Do they connect with you? And you can say maybe that's fair, maybe that's not fair, but that's just how it works. 
Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Hey, I, you mentioned Monsters in the Woods. I have a, how did you connect with Glenn Plummer? Because he, he is a phenomenal actor. Yeah, well, um, <clears throat> so I had actually worked with him twice before that. No, once before that, then that. So I was uh, I was DPing a movie for the filmmaker that made the Black Jesus movie. And uh, he was doing this low budget thing and Glenn Plummer was doing like a cameo in it. So that's where I first met him and shot him. And, you know, we we talked. But then um, actually on Monsters in the Woods, there was another actor in it. And, you know, we were like, man, we got a spot here where we could use a name and we could shoot him out in a couple of days. And he's like, we well, you know Glenn, Glenn Plummer's my boy. I can get him down. And I was like, oh, I know Glenn. And so he just made a call. And a couple of days later, Glenn was there and did it. And then it just by happenstance, I was directing a movie maybe two or three years after that for another company. And he was one of the stars of that, too. So, like, we, we've worked together several times. But honestly, until this movie, like, I never had his phone number. You know, like we never really communicated outside of doing the movies. You know? mm -hmm. But anyway, it was a, just a, it was another actor. The actor got him in. So I gave the actor a co-producer credit and, you know, he, he got Glenn in. I was, I was watching Monsters in the Woods and I, I was like, man, he is such a good, because I, I, the, really I remember him from, have you ever seen Colors? That movie yes. from the 80s? Yeah, yeah. that's, I, I don't know if that was the first film he ever did, but I remember him very well from that film and watching Monsters, I've forgotten how good of an actor he is. He is such a good actor. Oh, I'm, I'm excited to see him in The Craving. Well, you know, what was really impressive too about Monsters in the Woods is like he had a lot of dialogue and uh, there was a, uh, like a miscommunication between the co-producer and like Glenn. So like Glenn never got the, the sides, like the full sides for the day. So like, he didn't like, he saw his big giant monologue. It was like, like a page and a half, like about 10 minutes before we shot it. And he, like, he basically just like, you know, he, he looked at it. He's like, Oh, like we were rolling. And he was like, Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. He's like, it's like, 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 give, give me five. And uh, we were like, okay. So he sat there and he was just looking at it and you could see him. He was running his finger. He was like, you know, mouthing the words. And he did it like, maybe he looked through it three times, like like less than less than the five minutes. I want to say three minutes. And then he was like, okay. And I was like, and I'm sitting here thinking, okay, we're going to get this in chunks. And I call action and almost verbatim, he did the whole thing, just nailed it. You know, we did like three takes and then that was it. He, and wow. he nailed it. And I, I saw a similar thing I was uh, editing a movie with uh, Corey Feldman and like, you know, I'm not saying Corey Feldman's the best actor in the world, but the, he came in, in in that same kind of situation. He had a two and a half page monologue. He had never, never saw the sides, whether they didn't give them to him or he didn't read them, whatever. But he looked at it and like in 40, I, I want to say like 45 seconds, like he just took it, went mm, and then just did the monologue. You know, it's like wow. pros that have done it that long. They can just, a lot of them can just have affinity for it. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, Glenn was Glenn was great, and and, and he's got a really cool role in Craving. So I'm, I'm I'm looking forward to it. Like I get to I get to play with him a little bit more than I have in the past. It's, so let's 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 fast forward to let's talk let's start talking about the Craving because I'm I'm okay. I I, I want to talk about this movie. It's it's uh it, it's exciting. Um, so let's talk about the crowdfund. Um, sure. so to, to my audience out there, there's a really fantastic video Jason did on his YouTube where he goes in depth into to what he did. And that's, that's why I did the caveat I did earlier because you put a lot of prep and a lot of work. I, you started what two or three months before you actually even went live on the campaign. you started all the, totally. the, yeah, the yeah. little steps. Yeah, do, yeah. do you mind kind of just going into it? Yeah. Yeah. And if you, if you look, if you actually like do your research, like on crowdfunding, most experts will tell you like you need a 60 to 90 day prep lead up into a campaign. There, there are very few people out there that can just like soft launch a campaign and be successful. I'm not saying it can't be done, but for the most part, you need that prep. Like you have to, you have to build up and engage your audience. You have to connect with new people. You have to create material to share during that campaign. You have to have new stuff to share every day, like what, you know, whether it's art or, you know, new pieces or memes or whatever. Like if you're just posting the same two or three things over and over and over, it's just people are going to tune it out. So like you have to keep it engaged. So, yeah. And honestly, in my in my case, I think one of the big 
uh, factors in the campaign being successful was my YouTube channel, which, you know, I actually spent, you know, two years prior to the campaign building up that YouTube channel, not for the crowdfunder, but it is definitely a contributing factor. And I only have, I don't know, like just under 7,000 subscribers. So it's not like huge numbers, but I have a, I have a highly engaged audience and a lot of people that want to give back because I, like I've been giving so freely. You know, and I think, and and just in general, my like my online persona, which you know lines up really strongly with my actual persona. Like I am a very like I am an open book. I I will tell you exactly how I did this thing, or exactly how I got the money for it, or exactly how I distributed it. And filmmakers, other filmmakers, really appreciate that. And even people that aren't filmmakers, they see the, the I don't know the, the genuine intent behind it, and that translates. You know, so yeah. and I think those things are some of the biggest factors like you could run a perfect campaign but if like if you don't have a personal connection to the audience it's not going to work yeah yeah have, having a uh, having someone out there like you i mean just just as you know as somebody who's who's, who's a first time filmmaker there's there's so much that you just it's like how do I do this how do I do this you know and and it's it's I don't know where to go from this but I, I we're so lucky there are so many people out there like yourself I mean there's so many podcasts and YouTube channels and things like that I mean it's really just just as someone who's new to all of this just I can tell you like we're we're really grateful for people like you because it's just super helpful oh totally okay so you've done you've done all this prep work. You kick it off, and was was it in four four days? You made your entire your entire budget, your entire. Uh, um, I'm drawing a blank on the word to use. Oh, for the Indiegogo, for yes, yeah, um, yeah. We uh, so one of the things. So our first goal was twenty five thousand dollars. Now, it was twenty five thousand dollars really my goal? No. Um, could I make a version of the movie for twenty five thousand? Yes, but it's not where I wanted. My my actual goal was uh, fifty thousand, you know. But um, so this was from talking to a consultant. And had I done this on my own, I would have set that goal at fifty thousand, and that's I would have went with that. Um, he told me about. Uh, he's like, look, how much do you think you can raise? And I said, well, I think I can raise fifty. He said, well, set your goal at half of that. And he was like, because it, it's like it's about momentum and making goals and then setting your stretch goals, because like you would think that once you reach that goal, you would kind of stop getting donations because you made your goal. But that's not how crowdfunding works. There's like there's a psychological thing where people see a thing that's that's doing well, that's succeeding or more than succeeding and they come back in. So at least if you're looking to raise, you know, 50 or 60,000, I think setting you know, a $20,000 goal or $25,000 goal is going to be better than setting it at the 50, you know? But what's important is you, you could have done the film at either, at either mark. Yeah, totally. Now I, there is a version that I could, and, and, and you, and you have to be transparent and honest about it. Now, if, if there is no way that I could make, you know, any version of this at 25,000, I would have to say that otherwise I, it would be, you know, disingenuous. Um, but yes, there, there's a version of the movie I could have made. But I, you know, I, I didn't want to, you know, and I, and honestly, if we would only made 25, I probably would have went and kept looking for more traditional funding to, to bulk that up. But the, the movie would have got made either way, but, but yeah, in, incremental goals, you know, like, so you set it at 25, we hit the 25, I think in four days, four or five, and then, you know, set your next stretch goal at 30 and then you hit 30 and it also gives you something new to post about. Because one of the hardest things about posting these campaigns is you got to post like, you know, 12, 15 times a day and you need fresh stuff to post. And after like day five, I guarantee you're going to start running out of stuff to say. So yeah. like it helps saying, hey, we're $100 away from our stretch goal. Hey, we just made our stretch goal. Hey, we got a new stretch goal. You know what I mean? It just keeps, it, you know, it keeps interest, keeps things, you know, keeps you, keeps you with stuff to say. <laughs> yeah. Well, you talked about in that video too, that you had like 28 days worth of stuff on standby in case you needed something to post one day. You know, there was just, you had a day where you just couldn't yeah. think of something where you could go and grab one of these posts and put it up there. But so it sounds like though, when, when you came up with the craving and, and you were putting everything together, hitting pre-production or headed, headed towards pre-production, 
you have like four different plans. I mean, it's like, okay, you know, if we can hit this number, I can make the film. If we can hit this number, I can definitely make the film that I want to make. Right. But if, if all of that fell through, you, there was still a plan C there and maybe yeah, even a totally. plan D. Totally. And, 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 and what you, what I, what I'm finding anyway now is like, I'm, I'm in like a plan like C dash five right now. Cause you know, I had a plan to make a $50,000 version of the movie. And then we, you know, we, I think we're at 56,000 right now. And, uh, and of course, you know, we'll only collect about 50 of that after everything's said and done. Um, but, uh, you know, now, you know, has I, you know, like I just started releasing funds for the special effects and now we're getting ready to lock down a location and now I'm realizing that shit for like another $5,000, like I could get like a much better location or I could have the location for three or four more days, which that kind of time on a movie at this budget level is just so valuable. So I'm, you know, I'm looking to raise another probably 10 or 15 that I hadn't initially planned on, you know, but now I'm kind of back doing that. And I'll put the, I'll put the link to the crowdfund in the, uh, yeah, yeah, the show sure. notes yeah, at the end. That, yeah, that's absolutely. Great. That's the really great thing about Indiegogo too, is that the in demand thing, once you meet your goal, you, you can just, you can keep selling perks on in demand for, you know, indefinitely, you know, like that, that'll probably stay up until, I don't know, June or July. Do you do you mind going into detail about what building this film looked like? Because I I, I I'm, I'm curious myself. Like, let's start with like the script. Where did the idea for the story come from? What what did that writing process look like? And I want to go to like how do you how did you get Felissa Rose? How did you you know how did you get all these big actors that you have for this film? Like, do do you mind going into detail about what it looked like to build this project? Um, sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, the writing of it was, I mean, you know, it was typical, you know, writer stuff. I, and I, this is an old script. This has been around for at least a decade. I think I wrote it, the first version of it, like not too long after Edges of Darkness. Like it wasn't my follow up for it or nothing, but it was, it was somewhere in there. Like I, I was a really prolific writer for about six years. I, I, I think I wrote almost 20 scripts between like 2008 and 2010. Like I just, I was just cranking them out, you know? And uh, it was originally called Exit, and it was somewhere in there. And um, it was uh, it was initially inspired. Um, I, you know, I was super, I was super into Tarantino, and I was, uh, and I really liked the the genre blending in uh, uh, From Dust Till Dawn. And uh, so that that was kind of the initial thing. I wanted to do a, a dust from dust fil, dust, <laughs> from dust till dawny kind of you know genre flip thing. But mm -hmm. like, but a, a little more of a, a through line through it, where it wasn't like two completely different movies, but it did kind of play with the different genres. You know, it's a little crime, it's a little horror. You know? Okay, I liked that. How, how long like, of a script is it? Um, like currently, it's uh, like nine, 95 pages, I think. Ninety-five, ninety-six. Um, I usually on on most independent stuff, I aim for like ninety pages. Like okay. you know, anything shorter, you, you know, like you don't have enough to play with to, you know, work on your pacing. You know, like if you do an 80 page script or a 70 page script, you pretty much got every single thing you've written goes in. And if you take it out, your movie's too short. Although these days that's that's mattering less and less with streaming. You know, like when I was first putting movies out, like, you know, it, you had a hard like if you had to make 75 minutes, you know, like with credits. Yeah, or without credits or shit, I forget how it goes. But, you know, if it was too short, you know, you were screwed. Like, I, actually, one of my uh, first editing jobs was taking movies for this low-budget production company and expanding them to make the 80-minute runtime, you know, because, like, they shot them and it was too short. So that's always been in my mind. So I, I like, and I and I just think 90s, like, hour and a half, like, it's just, a that's a good, like, horror movie length, somewhere between 80 and 90. You know, so, you know, so that's where I am. Do you, do you know how many drafts you've been through on it? I I honestly couldn't tell you. Um, for, at, at, at least, I mean, as far as radically different drafts, pro probably only five or six. But like, like I've tinkered with it on and off, you know, for, for ten years. So it, it's one of those scripts. It's always been one of my favorite scripts. So like, if I ever go through a period where I haven't written for a while, it's usually the one I'll pull out and start like tinkering with it. So it's went through a lot of changes, like the. The story has always been basically the same. Structure has always been basically the same. But like I've changed the setting like probably half a dozen times. Like it started out, it was like a it was like a rural factory, 
and then it was a graphic design studio in like downtown Burbank, and then it was uh, um, shit. I can't. It was a few different things. Now we've ended on a rural bar. Is, is where it ended up. <laughs> so, so what what made you settle on the bar? Um, uh. So I, I like I, the, the, it had to be rural. So like the couple of times that I made it in the city, it just never made sense. The cops would have been there. So I wanted something rural and isolated, but I, I also, and then for a while there, I was real stuck on it being like a workplace, you know, with everybody there as workers. But then there was something about that dynamic. I wanted them to be more strangery, the, the people that were being held hostage. So it made more sense for it to be someplace that people came to. So, you know, it was going to be a bar or a restaurant or something like that. And I, and I just, I, I really like, I have an affinity for like rural, like divey bars. So, you know, like I, I like road houses and I like, uh, um, like, like, like really like dank, like sports bars. It's just a thing. I, I like, I, I mean, I don't like hanging out there, but I like the visual aesthetic. Yeah. Like, yeah. Near, just near, dark, and... near dark is one of my like all time favorite horror movies. And I, I just freaking love that bar. So one of the things I'm really excited about, given that, like, I, I th- would you say, and, I, and I've not read the script. I, I think I know as much about the film as, as most everybody else, right. but um, is there going to be a lot of psychological elements to this story? Yeah. going to be yeah. kind of questioning what's real and what's not. Right. Well, yeah, it's kind of a, I, like I would describe it. I mean, it's not so much not what's real and what's not, but it's like, like it, it's a little bit of a whodunit. So like, like we know that there is a horror element. We know that there is a monster. We don't know who the monster is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so a lot of it's figuring that out. So kind of like the thing in a way. A little bit like the thing. And it has kind of a, again, you know, I mentioned Tarantino and it has this kind of reservoir dogs structure a little bit where, you know, your main story is in the bar and this thing that's taking place in the bar in real time. And then you're introduced and find out who the characters are through flashbacks, like, or, you know, nonlinear flashbacks, like in the way that Reservoir Dogs did with its characters. Mm -hmm. So, like, we see in the flashbacks that, okay, there's a creature and there's something like killing people and we know it's one of them, but we don't know who, you know. That's such a fantastic way to do a, a smaller budget film. And, it, it, and, and you, on paper, it looks like it would be easy, but it's not because you have to find a way to engage an audience for an hour and a half in yeah. a single room. Yeah. You know, well, it, and to, you know what? W- one thing that really hit me too about the, the difficult and, and not creatively, because I like I've never had a problem with it creatively. I've always like, yeah, this is going to be a really good movie. But once I start when I and I actually first started thinking about this as I'm prepping the crowdfunding campaign, because crowdfunding is all about marketing. Like it's all about marketing the film. And I'm like, wait a minute, because this is like really if you broke it down. Like, you know, it's, you know, it's, you know, it's like 50% crime thriller and 50% horror movie, you know, but, but like, how do you sell that? You know what I mean? Cause like, if, if I say that, if I say, Hey, it's 50% thriller, 50% horror movie to horror fans are kind of like, me, mm, they want a horror movie. They want a monster movie. So like, right. I know that I want to sell it as a monster movie. And then what do I need to do creatively to make sure that I'm fulfilling that promise? You know what I mean? That's been, that's been the biggest, uh, like challenge and, and yeah. still remains to be, you know? Yeah. Do you ever, do you ever worry about, um, do you, do you, I, you know, there, there's so many things today that I think, uh, there's a lot of controversy with trailers, you uh-huh. know, like, like oh, trailers yeah. today that they give away the whole movie and stuff like that. Do you, do you ever have fears about like, you know, uh, what if, what if I oversell this or, you know, what, what if I set the expectations wrong, things like that? Do you ever worry about stuff like that? Um, I mean, yeah, I think everybody does, but I mean, here's the thing. And I hear filmmakers like talking about this all the time. Like they don't want to do this because they're going to give too much away or, you know, what always, I'm just it's a little bit of a digression, but what always trips me out is when you'll have like this independent, like $20,000 movie, you know, like nothing, no, there's no, audience expectation for this anywhere there's no stars in it there's no nothing and the filmmakers are like you like banning cell phones on set and they're like uh because you know, they don't want any pictures leaking out or they don't want a picture of the of the killer or they don't want the uh, spoilers and i'm like when you're making an independent movie you need every single bit of ammo to get anyone to even care yeah. so 
I personally don't like, I like, I'm not going to give away who the monster is. I'm not going to show the monster in its full like glory, but I'll, I'll show some, some early sketches. I'll show what we think it's going to look like. I'll show some stuff while he's building it. Uh, I'll do whatever I can to get people to check out the movie. So, I mean, that's like, as an independent filmmaker, you like, you can't be secretive. You can't right. be Mr. Box filmmaking as a $20,000 filmmaker because nobody gives a shit. <laughs> that's such a good point. I never considered that. Nobody that's such gets. a good point, man. Yeah, like, like you, you want that exposure. You want the leaks. You want to get people interested. Ah, uh, dude, my uh, our special effects artist is on a show right now, or, or just finished it a couple of weeks ago, and it's like I want to say it's under a hundred thousand dollars. No stars in it. Nobody cares. And they they made they were having everybody sign NDAs, and they're like, "No, you're going to do this, and you're not going to do that." And I'm like, like man, nobody nobody cares. Like nobody like if if I were to show a full like shot of our monster and put it online i'd get like 80 or 90 likes and a few comments on it like nobody would care and a year from now none of them people are even going to remember you know what i mean by the time the movie actually comes out you know I, I could tell you i could give away the entire ending right now and by the time the movie came out you know even say say 2,000 people watch this between now and then half of them won't remember and you know and half of them will never track it down anyway you know yeah so, no, so, and, and the whole indie could change too. You know, you yeah, can just throw totally. a curveball. <laughs> yeah. But I don't, I, I'm not too guarded about it. And I'm, all, I, 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 you know, I, yeah, it would be cool if we could just keep everything in secret and make it and surprise everybody. That'd be great. But that's just not the world we live in anymore. Okay. Jason, I got to tell you, man, you really have your finger on the pulse of the marketing thing, you know, cause like when you, when you talk about this, I mean, like you, you really have it figured out, man. I would have never thought about that. Like, like uh, any exposure is good exposure. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll say this to that too, like, cause I, I'm kind of, I'm dealing with this on my channel a lot now. Cause like, you know, you have to speak about things with confidence, right? And as soon as you admit that you don't really know what you're talking about or, or that, you know, there's areas of grays, people stop listening to you. They're like, oh wait, this guy goes noise. Cause here's the truth. The, like the real hundred percent truth. I don't know jack shit. You know, like, I, like I know this stuff that's like worked for me sometimes, sometimes it hasn't. You know, I had a movie, uh, Campus Death Day, came out three years ago, and I, I knew all this shit then. I did all this stuff, and it failed. It failed major. Didn't make any money. You know, it it, it, it happens. You know, and a, a lot of it, I, you know, I, I don't want to say luck, but 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 you know, the the mar the marketplace sometimes does. There is an element. There is a strong element of luck to it. You know, so and everything that I'm talking about right now, it could be a hundred percent different tomorrow. And it's also different for each individual movie. Like, you know, I'm talking about how I raised money for Craving. You know, it's a specific movie from a specific filmmaker. You know, someone else can do all these exact same steps, exact, and and totally fail. Maybe they'd raise $2,000. And then I'm full of shit. You know what I mean? I, I think, but, but I, 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 there's something to be said about the material. Though. There's something to be said about the story. I mean, maybe their script isn't as good as yours. You know, maybe the concept of the story, because like, I mean, isolation horror. I, I love isolation horror. I love the thing. Oh, me too. Like, I, I, stuff. Yeah. I'm so shocked to hear that the thing failed oh, so miserably when it first came out. I'm like, how? I mean, the the, I the special effects are amazing. It's John Carpenter. It's got that awesome synth soundtrack. Kurt Russell's amazing. Keith David's amazing. It's set in this Arctic. Like, I, I legit. To, to, I'm not kidding. To this day, I've always wanted to go to Antarctica because of that movie. I want to go to a year in Antarctica because it's just, you know, like I, I in fact, I need to read who goes there. I, I've not ever read. Yeah, the, I've never done it either. A friend of mine's really into it. The thing is his absolute favorite movie. And, you know, he, he's the one that I mean, I'd seen it when I was a kid and I liked it, but I didn't really, it didn't have that big an impact on me at like whatever, 10, but uh, in college, it was one of my all time favorites. And we watched it like over and over. Did you watch the thing from another world? The, the one in the fifties? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen that too. It was, a, I, it was the vegetable. Yeah, <laughs> it was the giant. It wasn't a carrot, but it was like a giant vegetable. That's um, you know what's so terrifying about that movie is the sound the creature makes. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. The sound design and that's incredible. Yeah, that that was that was really. Have you ever done any black and white work? Not really. I mean, I, I've I've turned a few things black and white after the fact, but um, not really. Um, it, it isn't something that that 
you know, I have no problem with the technique, but it doesn't really, uh, uh, whatever, it doesn't do it for me as an artist. I, I haven't had anything that I'd want to do that for. And, gotcha. you know, micro budget stuff, it's, it's just another barrier to entry. You know, like whenever people, see, there's two trains of thought with micro budget. One is you're making a micro budget, there's very little risk, so you might as well go for it and do weird stuff. But you get to a point like me where I've done so many and now there is a practical like monetary element to it. Like I do need things to make some money in order to you know keep food on my table. So, mm -hmm. you know, now making a movie like, you know, if somebody had a really great artistic reason to, to do craving in black and white, I would probably 86 it because it, it would it would it would stunt my my potential sales. Yeah. Do I mean do do you think do you think there's kind of a niche audience for black and white that it's not as well received? I mean, I'm sure I'm sure there probably is. Um, but I mean, I mean, just look, it, there's less and less of it being done. So I, yeah. I, I, I'm sure there is an audience for it, but I, I wouldn't necessarily know how to reach them. Gotcha. That ma that makes sense. Let's let's talk about Robert Bravo for a second. Your special effects sure. guy and your your um how how did how did you meet him? How did you start um, working with him? I met him at Starbucks. He was the producer at Starbucks that, that put a little bit of money into Trap. Um, I, I think I first met him when I was finishing up Edges of Darkness, though he wasn't really a part of that. And then he came on and helped produce Trap. And he, he's just like one of the most like genuine, nice people you'll ever meet in your life. So, you know, we just we became lifelong friends then. And he is so good on a set like not. And I don't mean because of like like his skills, like he is skilled. But it's just like his personality. I have never seen a better like like peacemaker negotiator like on set than him. Like I, on on trap, we had a situation come up where like I had uh, I had we were at a private home basically, and like I had used uh, a piece like one of their personal items and I had put it on a wall, you know, and, and which I shouldn't have done. And they were ready to kick us out of the place over it. And he, the way he de escalated it was just masterful, you know, and then, and I've seen him do that time and time again. He's been on, I'd say like 75% of my sets after that, you know, there's a few where I was working with other people that I couldn't bring him on, but for the most part, I bring him on anything I can. He's and, he's pretty much become your partner in crime, yeah, so to speak. And yeah, and has a special effects artist. Like he's just grown exponentially. I mean, he was doing stuff that was pretty cool back then, but like, you know, especially for the budgets. But you know, like now today, the stuff that he can do for those budgets. I mean, our we we've said it a few times, like during the campaign, but it's really not hyperbole. Like our effects are not going to look like a fifty thousand dollar movie. Like it it's it's going to be pretty pretty neat. But I mean, it doesn't have to. I mean, like I, I, I think I think most people in horror they want to see practical effects. Yeah, yeah, totally. Know? And 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 I and I think like even even if some of the things aren't, you know, uh, the greatest in the world, I think there's going to be a lot of grace there because I think any any true horror fan out there is going to appreciate the fact that you went with practical over CG. Yeah, um, totally. Yeah, and it. it, it, it it adds another sell point to it, honestly. I mean, it, and we built a lot of our campaign around that, and yeah. it brought in brought in some brought in a lot of donations. Will there will there be any CG in the film at all? Or is it going to be all practical? Yeah, I won't say there won't be any, but there, there won't be a lot. Like there, there's a couple instances, like especially today, especially like especially after the Alec Baldwin situation, like uh, like practical explosive squibs and like that. Especially in Los Angeles, like you have to be super careful it's super expensive to do it and so like you could try you could do it gorilla i guess and find people that'd be willing to do it but honestly like i wouldn't i wouldn't want any of that being done by anyone that wasn't like a hundred percent a pro and every hundred percent pro is going to want it done by the book and honestly we just couldn't afford it i couldn't afford the armor or i couldn't afford the cop on set you know like stuff like that so like we will like for like a bullet hit, for example, if somebody gets shot in the head, like their bullet effect would be done practical and it would just be there. And then I'll cover their forehead up, you know, with a with a mask so you don't see it. And then when the shot happens, you know, I'll lose that mask and there will be like a little digital like, you know, mm -hmm. and then the real practical effect comes out the back of the head, stuff like that. Yeah. 
but, or, or like, you know, we're going to be shooting exteriors and, you know, as opposed to constructing a giant, you know, signage for it, it'd be really freaking easy for me to go in like Photoshop or After Effects and, and build a sign and put it on the, 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 the place or removing, you know, it's supposed to be rural. So if there's, you know, phone, extra phone lines and power lines or maybe houses that might get in the shot, you know, I can map those out, stuff like that, 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 but no, like there won't be any CG monster stuff. So, so when, let's go back to the script. So, so when you, when you have a script like this, you, you've written it, you, you maybe set it aside for a little while when you're ready to actually do something, but what do you do? Do you send it to your friends to read? Do you have people in the industry you send it to? Like what, what's your process with that? So I'm, I'm different than a lot of people. Like, I don't, so I, I think that it can be valid to get input. And by saying what I'm about to say, I'm not saying not to send your script out for people for input, but I honestly, I have found over the years that like script notes in general are kind of, are kind of a waste. Um, and, and like, I have a friend right now who, uh, you know, he finished his movie, his script about a year ago and in my opinion, he killed his script by sending it to freaking everybody he knows. He got all these conflicting notes and he tried to make everybody happy and he came up with this hodgepodge mess. And then he's kind of doing the same thing in post-production where he's just he's showing it to too many people, asking for too many opinions. I mean, I, I, I am pretty much like I keep everything very insular. Like I like uh, I, I usually don't show cuts or or versions of scripts to people until it's like done, done. Then I have like two or three people that I trust that, that I'll ask for some notes, you know, but, but not a lot. For the most part, I just, I just do it and trust my instincts and go with it. So when, when you're ready to go with the script, let's talk about casting. How, hmm. what, what's your process for casting film, especially when you get the talent that you've got? Uh, I mean, how, how do you, how do you, do you go to an agency and just make a pitch or how does that work? I mean, you know, mo all, so like I've directed movies where the producers did use casting directors and whatnot on the stuff that I've done myself. I've never really used them. I mean, sometimes I'll have a friend that might help out with casting and I'll call him a casting director. But I mean, for the most part, it, like it's not like there, there's no magic about like, like casting names, like all the managers and agents contacts are right up on IMDb Pro. So mm -hmm. you, when you're ready to make an offer, you just, you go there, you get their contact, you call them or you email them and you say, Hey, I'm shooting, you know, March 3rd. Um, I, you know, I need your client for two days. Um, this is my intended budget and they'll either accept it or they won't, you know, and then you either go to an another one or you negotiate and it like there, but there's no, there's no magic to it. Like, unless you're going for like, you know, like Brad Pitt or Tom Cruise or somebody, mo most like, you know, B, like, you know, lower A, C level actors, if you got the money and they got the time, they're going to take it, you know? So that that's pretty much how most of my casting has worked. Now with Glenn, you know, I had a personal connection. So I just, I just send him an email. Hey, do you want to do this thing? Yeah. You know, or like with Felissa, she's good friends with one of the other producers. They've worked with her a few times. So mm -hmm. he just called her up. Hey, do you want to do the movie? Yeah. You know, Bill Ober, same thing. Uh, Bravo had worked with him on a few things, and everybody that's worked with Bravo loves Bravo. So he was like, "Yeah," and like that. It was that simple, you know. And I've had others like not on Craving, but other movies where I just went to IMDb, looked up the manager, called the manager, made an offer, and you know they did the movie. So, so for for the new filmmakers out there who have not dealt with managers and things like that, when you when you're going to make an offer for a talent at, at whatever level. Is there is there sort of a range that you need to have in mind? Like, how, how do you come up with you know the budget? Of like, okay, I want to offer this person you know X number of dollars. Like, how do you come up with that number? Um, I mean, I, honestly, just over the years, it's just been experience, and you know, I, I've made some low ball offers in the past, but like, if if you make a, an offer too low, they're gonna tell you. <laughs> you know, like uh, I was doing an anime, I was producing an animated series at Gas Money Pictures, and we made an offer to David Arquette, and this was like. This was kind of in like his down downturn, you know, like before he did the wrestling, right before he did the wrestling thing, he'd kind of disappeared. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I was thinking, you know, it'd be, you know, five or six grand a day was what I was thinking. 
And so I don't even know if I should, no, I'll share it. I don't care. And so I, you know, I make like a five grand offer and, you know, the agent, uh, we were emailing, he, he emailed me back. He's like, uh, for a day. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, he, he, he starts at 25,000 a day. And I was like, oh, okay. And then, so now grant we didn't get him, but if I had 25,000, I could have done it, you know? But that, that's what will happen. They'll either – and sometimes they'll just ignore you. If, if like, if you make a $2,000 offer to, a you know, a, a $20,000 actor, most likely they'll just ignore you and you won't hear back from them. Um, if it's a phone call, they'll tell you on the phone call. And, and you might have a moment of embarrassment. But, you know, it, it's, you know, par for the course. Is that a recoverable mistake, though? I mean, like, if, if you do totally. that uh, – oh, it's, they, totally, they it's totally recoverable. And, 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 and it's also how you play it. Like, so I, I, I won't say who, but I, so I made an offer. Oh, okay, I'll say who. So I made a, I made a low ball <laughs> offer to Casper and Van Dien's agent, actually for this movie, but, but way, way back. Like I was trying to produce uh, Craving as Exit back in like 2012. And I had Robin Givens attached. I had uh, uh, Michael Madsen. Now he, he, so he had agreed, but he wasn't attached yet. And then I was making an offer to Casper Van Dien. And, uh, and so I, I, I needed him for like two days. So like I, I made like a 10, I said, oh, I'm sorry. No, no. I said $7,000. And, uh, and, uh, the guy was like, 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 and this was not too long after Starship Troopers and all that. And the guy was like, dude, he, like, he don't get out of bed for less than 75. I was like, I was like, what did I say? He said, he said 7,000. I said, oh, I meant 75. You know? <laughs> wow that's so that's such a lucky recovery <laughs> but but I, I was just quick on my feet but i mean the truth of the matter is though the guy wasn't rude or nothing he was just like he was like he was like come on dude <laughs> that ain't, that ain't good. but you know and, and i still like that agent i talked with him for another actor uh maybe a year later and did something else i don't know if he remembered me or not but it, it didn't i wasn't blacklisted i'll say that <laughs> That's, that's good to know. Yeah. I, I think, I think that's, that's also yeah. when, when and, you're first and entering. And what I would recommend, honestly, um, like, you know, if you were trying to price out an actor like that, go on to IMDb pro find producers that have produced other movies with that actor and just ask some now most people, cause you know, if that's proprietary information, most won't share it, but you, they might give you a ballpark. Like instead of asking like, how much did you pay for Casper Van Dien? You know, you might say like, like, like ballpark, what would I, what would I be paying for an actor at the level of Casper Van Dien and somebody else? And they, they might give you a ballpark, you know? So it, people, people want to share information. They like, they, like, they want to be helpful if, if you give them the opportunity. And most, some don't, but most. Like I do, you, do you know why that information seems to be held so close to the vest though? You know, why, why it is a secret? Cause people, I mean, filmmakers need to know, you know, I, 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 I yeah. don't understand that. I, I, so I've always been kind of a radical transparency person. Like I've always believed in telling people, yeah, it, it, I, I think it's not even so much the film business. I think there's just a, this old like mentality, you know, from the, you know, boomer generation and before where it's like, you don't talk about money. You don't talk about what you earn, you know, like that. It's just it, like, it's rude. It's uncouth. You just, you don't do it. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and that very attitude has allowed, you know, certain people in higher positions to kind of screw people over over the years, you know? Um, you know, like it happens with the dis like distributor transparency. And now that there are distributors like Indie Rights who are practicing radical transparency, and I think you're seeing less and less of, you know, the, the bad ones because of that. But yeah, I, I think it's just an old, I think it's an old fashioned, older generation attitude that, yeah, that yeah. has just bled over into filmmaking. It just, but it also almost seems like there's almost this, um, like this in club, you know, you have to, like, there are, there are, there's talent out there. You cannot have access to unless yeah. you are in the and club. It's like, there is no there, public information. And there are, and there are people out there that feel like, you know, we'll stay in the filmmaking realm that they feel like if they share the information, they're going to have more competition. You know what I mean? Like, Oh, I can't let you know what I know. Cause then you're going to be, you're going to be my competition next month. I don't, I don't believe in that. Um, I just don't believe in that mindset. You know, I don't, I don't believe in a competition mindset. I, I used to, and, I, like, and, it, and it drove me in certain ways and it can be a positive driver too, 
you know, like trying, trying to compete, but I don't know. I, all I'm going to say on that for, for me, like my whole career changed for the better when I dropped that, when I started sharing, when I started being more open, like mm-hmm. when I stopped being like the negative person online, like, you know, you see him all the time online, like, you know, the, they'll, you know, complaining about other filmmakers in general or other filmmakers do this or they did that or they did, and they might have valid points, but just, like putting out that like that negative energy into the world you get it back you know and if yeah. you put out positive energy in the world you get that back and i don't think it's like no hippy dippy thing i just think it's it's practical if you're a nice person and you are nice to people people are going to be nice back to you generally speaking do you think things are starting to kind of shift that way i mean especially as as the newer generation is entering the film world that they they may have that same attitude do you see things shifting I think more. I think more so because I, I. I think another thing that's happening with filmmaking, anyway, it's becoming more and more democratized. Like it, it's there, there's a much lower barrier to entry now than there was even ten years ago. It's cheaper to make movies. It's cheaper to make them look better. Um, you know, there's there's which on one hand is is cool because you know like everybody can do it and now and a lot of disenfranchised voices that that couldn't do movies ten or twenty years ago now can. You know, and you're seeing new kinds of movies come out because of it. But on the other hand, now everybody can make movies. Everybody's making movies. And, you know, the value of those individual movies kind of goes down. So, like, you know, the exact same movie, you know, if you were to make it today, you know, $50,000 movie today, $50,000 movie five years ago would be worth this, you know, be higher. And that exact same movie is worth about like half the amount or less than half the amount today because there's just more content. So now as a micro budget filmmaker, you know, I I have to make, you know, like 10 movies a year to make what I was making off two or three five years ago, you know. So so as an experienced filmmaker, what do you see people doing wrong that that are that are entering the the film realm? They're you know, they're getting their first film out there. What, what are the common mistakes you're seeing that you would say don't do this? So, I mean, first off is the the competition mindset, you know, like uh, comparing themselves to others, trying to outdo them. I think that's one big one. Um, in distribution, I think people trying to hold on to these old, outdated ideas of what distribution is. You know, like they, they're, they're trying to do like the film festival win and they're trying to get, you know, an MG, a minimum guarantee that's going to cover their budget. They're trying to get these individual foreign sales in dozens of territories. And this stuff, I'm not saying it doesn't completely exist anymore, but it doesn't exist on the level that it did 10 years ago. Like or red box deals or, or people or filmmakers are fixated on trying to get on Netflix or Hulu or, you know, like what, you know, a big one. And and truth of the matter is, an independent film, if you were to get on Netflix, ain't gonna pay you very much, you know. And they're exclusive, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um, so I, I I think there's I think there's that. Like I like I know a filmmaker, and I, I won't uh, name her, but you know the, she's made uh, like half a dozen, maybe seven movies, and she's a good filmmaker. She does good movies, but she is stuck on this like distribution method that was hot five and 10 years ago and when she started making movies. So like the first movie made a lot of money and her movies have progressively made less and less money, but she's still doing the same thing with distribution. And she'll sit there and say that like the distribution method that I use, oh no, that's a last resort. You just use that as a last resort. I'm like, no, this is frontline distribution now for movies at this level. What you're doing is like, you know, it's, it's, it's dinosaur, you know, Mm -hmm. nine times out of 10, it's not going to make the money. In term in terms of the films themselves, what, what other kind of things are you seeing like in content? Um, what kind of mistakes do you see typically? I mean, that, that's that that's hard to say because you know it's it's such a subjective thing. Um, from mm-hmm. from a from a from a business standpoint, um, again, people and this this sounds like kind of counterintuitive logic on lower budgeted things, but people that make it too personal, too esoteric, like like you have to you have to or okay, wait, I'll take this back. Um, not, not thinking about thinking about yourself first and not the audience. That's the biggest thing. Like once you start actually thinking and creating for an audience, like, like it's, it's, it's hard to fail. Like if you're giving them and you're thinking about them and you're thinking about like, how long are they going to watch this? Where are they going to click off? 
where um, what is catching them? Give it, you know, what elements does this movie need to have to satisfy fans of this genre or subgenre? You know, and some people will say that's like uh, selling out or thinking cookie cutter, but it's not. You're 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 fulfilling a need, you know, and mm -hmm. it, it actually can be more creative working within those confines. That's an interesting point. Yeah, because I mean, ultimately, that's what leads to your success. I mean, it it, it it's it's art, but it still is business at the same time. You can't. Yeah, I think it goes it, it goes back to a little bit what I was saying earlier. When when you start giving. When you stop being self selfish, I hate to use that word, but like selfish filmmakers are going to be failing filmmakers in general, you know. And and the and the problem is is you know they all hold up filmmakers like Paul Thomas Anderson or Quentin Tarantino or uh, you know whoever uh, Chris Nolan and you know well they worked for them, they all won the fucking lottery. I'm I'm not taking any way, anything away from their talent. They're all uber talented, but there are a hundred filmmakers out there that you'll never fucking hear of that are just as talented that just didn't do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. That just didn't get that break and they all got breaks, you know? What has helped you get through some of the more trying times in your career, the more difficult times? Um, honestly, for me, it's just getting lost in the work. So like going right on to another project, you know, taking on another job. Um, mm -hmm. I think I find like the most depressing time for a filmmaker is usually like right after you finish a project. I, I even describe it sometimes as like, it's almost like postpartum depression. Cause like when you're on a set, you know, like you're, you're running a set, you know, whether it's, you know, five people or 30 people or whatever, you know, you're in charge, you're, you're kind of running on adrenaline, you're like, everything's like life or death. And it's, you know, high stakes and high anxiety and pressure. And then it's just gone, you know, like you, you rap and then you're just like back to regular life, you know, and for filmmakers that like work day jobs, even, you know, like when I was working at Starbucks still, like I would shoot like edges of darkness, you know, we'd shoot three or four days and then, you know, like, you know, we'd wrap at like midnight and like the next day at like 4 a.m. I'm back at Starbucks like, hey, you want foam on your latte? And, you know, it's 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 depressing, <laughs> you know, and then, you know, after you know, I haven't worked a day job in you know many years now. But, you know, when you when you finish on set, you still kind of have that like come down and, you know, like nobody's asking me questions you know like you yeah. might enjoy you on set but then now you're kind of like oh, where is everybody <laughs> so so and actually that that brings up something i was curious about too what what does life look like after a, a movie for you what's after a movie yeah so like so you, you've wrapped production it's it's out there you're you, what, what, what's next for you did you start writing something else do you like what, what does life look like after a movie yeah, I mean, usually I try to I jump into something else right away. So like, like especially as I've transitioned into like doing more producing, you know. So like, I, you know, at any given time, I probably have three or four projects going on. So when one wraps, I'm you know I'm at starting editing that, and then maybe I'm promoting another one. So it's like there's always some, and now I do a YouTube channel. So like there's always something to do. So it doesn't really my day-to-day -day doesn't really change that much. I'm just not on set. You're always creating content. It just, it's just a never yeah, extreme. Yeah. Like the, yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, like I went through phases where, you know, I would take more time off between stuff, but you know, I'm also, you know, I'm all, you know, I'm closer to 50 than 40 now. And, you know, I have so many years that I can keep this pace. So I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm going to spend as much time as I can working really hard over the next five to 10 years so that, you know, I can make, ensure I have a good retirement. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that makes total sense. That makes absolute yeah. sense. Um, who who would you say have been some of your heroes as, as a filmmaker? And, and have you gotten to meet any of them? Mm. Um, you know, not, a, not I haven't really met a lot of my heroes. Um, you know, I, I mentioned Tarantino a couple of times, like creatively, like he really like it, and it's both inspired me and opened me up to what independent film could be you know it wasn't and for tarantino it wasn't so much about what he was doing 
but was about how he would talk about other filmmakers and other filmmaking styles. And like, he got me into Jean Wu and got me into French new wave and, you know, like all this stuff made, made me understand the, you know, like, like I had seen all Walter Hill's movies, but I never put it together that Walter Hill was making all of these movies, you know, like 48 hours and the long, I never realized that the director of 48 hours did the long riders, you know, and did Southern comfort and, and, uh, streets of fire, you know, but as I, and after hearing Tarantino passionately talk about him, I'm like, Oh yeah, Walter Hill. Yeah. You know, and then, like I said, French new wave and foreign films and Hong Kong cinema, and, you know, just, it really opened it up. Um, you know, I, I was super, you know, I, I, I was coming of age in the, the 90s independent film explosion. So, you know, Quentin Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez and Kevin Smith and Allison Anders, you know, Richard Linkletter, like all those stories were super inspiring for, you know, people of my age and generation. And in a way, they were selling a false narrative, but it's what got me going. And honestly, I think like some false optimism is absolutely essential for starting filmmakers. Cause like if people really know the real, you know, m most won't do it. They will, you know, they would just say, okay, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. <laughs> you, know? you know, just, just, just to encourage you uh, from, from my perspective, man, I, I think you're on their level in your own right. I think what you're doing in independent film, I think the inspiration you are to others, I mean, the inspiration you've been to me and the, the short time that I've gotten to know you, mm. um, I like you're, you're the type of person I'm like, man, I want to learn everything I can from this guy. Like, like, I mean, I, j just, just to encourage you in your own right, I think you're every bit the filmmaker that they are. I, appre I appreciate that. And I'm not, you know, like I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, being self-effacing about it, but like I would say a major difference, you know, be between, you know, them and say me is like, you know, they came up in a time where the work really could almost just speak for itself, you know, mm -hmm. and, or at least the, you know, that was the, the perception, but, but it, but it does, you know, like, like Tarantino is a personality for sure. But, you know, I feel like, like, Rod like Rodriguez, I, 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 I couldn't even, I, I don't even remember what his voice sounds like. Cause you know, I haven't listened to a ton of interviews with him for him. My enjoyment of him was based solely on his work. You know, mm -hmm. it's like Tarantino, it's kind of a 50, 50 thing, but most everybody else, like it's, and, and I think with me, like, I think most of the people that, that, that really follow me, they, they follow me as a personality more than a filmmaker. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, and again, I'm not, I'm not, you know, crapping on my films, but, you know, I, I think that, you know, people gravitate towards me more for the information I'm sharing than the entertainment I'm providing, you know, in, in the films. Um, that kind of leads me into a, a, another question I have. Um, I think the film industry uh, is, is changing. You know, I, th I almost want to say we're in a renaissance in a way with with the way yeah. you, with content delivery and streaming and things. What would you say is wrong with the industry right now? And what would you do to fix it? Like if you were just handed the keys, the reins, and it's like <laughs> fix, fix Hollywood. Like what, what would you do? Um, to be 100% honest, I have no clue. I, I like I really don't. Um, you know, I, I don't think that there I don't think there is a perfect fix. You know, like, you know, 10 years ago, I would have said, you know, there needs to be less barrier to entry. Now there is less barrier to entry that now I would say, well, people need to be paid more for their content. But where is that money coming from? You know what I mean? Like people talk about Amazon and Amazon cutting the rates and whatnot. But, you know, Amazon's paying their subscription stuff out of subscription fees. And there's there's a ceiling to how many subscription fees they're going to get. You know what I mean? So there's a to keep your profits. There's and has more and more content comes in, those amounts are gonna get less and less. And, and I, I don't know how to change that. You know, it's like the, you hear a lot of, uh, you know, musicians talking about Spotify and, you know, that going down and how much they're getting paid for music going down and down and down. Um, there's a filmmaker I've interviewed on my channel a couple of times, uh, Michael Epstein. And he he talks about like he thinks that there's need for some kind of government regulation where there's a where like there's a standard that films need to be paid like per stream or per what well, you know whatever and that and that that's universal across platforms so that the, the you know the free market isn't setting the the like in other countries they do this 
and you know it's like a, maybe a step towards socialism or something i don't know but anyway he, he he thinks that that is a you know like basically what has to happen for filmmakers at an indie level to continue to be able to make livings um looking at it from my point of view i don't know if that's the answer or not but the way things are going like I think it's just going to get harder and harder to make any kind of money with smaller movies. You know, I mean, even just looking at my stuff, I have a library of about 60 titles and, you know, I, I'm making less per title today, like, like noticeably less than I was 12 months ago, you know, and, and I, and I think that that is going to continue to go down over the years. Like, I, like, I, I don't, I honestly don't know the answer. Do you, I mean, do you think the days of, and I guess this will kind of tie into uh, another question I was going to ask you. Um, one of the videos you had on your, your YouTube or you have on your YouTube channel, uh, talks about like the working man filmmaker, you know, and that's, yeah. I th would you kind of describe yourself as a working man filmmaker? Oh, yes. Yes. I, I'm like, I, I, I've had years where I make over six figures, but I make less than six figures some years, you know, like I'm not, I am, I'm not rich by any stretch of the imagination, you know, like I, I, you know, I, I rent a home. I, you know, I, I, I'm still paying off my car, you know, stuff like that. But, um, yeah, I'm definitely, you know, I guess what would be considered like, I guess, middle class, I guess. I don't even know what middle class is called these days, but something like that. Do, do you, do you think that it's, um, somebody that's, fresh to the industry, could they have the expectation of achieving even that level of success? Or do you think those days are actually disappearing? I, I think that there's, I, I, they're not gone, I, but I, I think it's, I think it's, I think it gets harder and harder. It, it's weird. It's, it's easier to make the movies. It's harder to make money off the movies. And, and I think that that will continue to, to be so. I mean, I, I, I don't know though. The, another thing that uh, a theory that I've heard is that the way things are fracturing, you know, there's so many more streaming networks than there ever were, and they're gonna start getting like more specific. You know, like like you already see it on Roku, like they have they have cannabis channels, you know, that, that are just cannabis content. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, maybe some of those new like niche things, you have a niche product, and you know, you can get it to there and maybe make some more money. Like maybe that will start happening a little bit more and that'll raise the value a little bit. But I don't know. I, it seems to me like just supply and demand, the, mm. there's more and more people making them and, and that just continues to go up and up and up. And, you know, the, the granted there are new avenues to watch them too, but you know, the audience uh, is so split and fractured. I just, uh, to me, I, I think it's going to continue to decline. So do you, do you think it's an inevitability then that maybe in the next, uh, I almost want to say five years, you know, especially if we're at the precipice of this bubble that, you know, the days of like the working man filmmaker, you know, unless you're already established, like somebody that's just coming in, like you're always going to probably work a nine to five in addition to making movies. Do you think that's sort of the inevitable end to all of this? Um, I, I think generally speaking, I hate to be a like doomsayer, but generally speaking, I think film, film like working class filmmakers going to there's going to be a lot more hobbyists and a lot less people. I think there'll be a lot fewer people like me, like like doing what I'm doing. Yeah, mm -hmm. like completely on your own, you know, with no outside, no real outside financing or, you know, no real studio level stuff. Um, yeah, cause I, I, I think it is going to get less, you know, and, and, you know, but then also you're seeing stuff like, you know, people finding ways to make livings off YouTube, you know, like, I mean, there, there is money to be made there and it's a global audience, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, I mean, we really are truly in a Renaissance then. I mean, it, 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 I would almost say it's fair to say that it's really pure speculation on what the film yeah. industry is going to yeah, look I'm like told, in 10 yeah. years. Yeah, whenever I say stuff like this, I always want I always want to put the caveat, look, guys, this is just how I see it from my viewpoint. But truth of the matter is, is that anybody in any interview like this that is sitting there saying this is how it's going to go like this or, or even this is how it is like in an absolute. They're full of shit because like, there is no this is how it is. It, it is it is shades of gray and it's different for different filmmakers. And, you know, yeah, I you know, I, one one theory I have, one one way I think things could go would be 
you know, especially with COVID having done what it's done, um, I could, I think it's very realistic that the theater industry could just outright crash and then things sort of go through a reboot and suddenly all of your art house theaters start popping up again. Like, you know, I'm from Nashville originally. And so in Nashville, you have the Belcourt theater and they right. play art house films. You know, um, I, I believe here in Knoxville, we have a, an art house theater as well. Um, I, I, I actually see things. And, and I mean, I'm not, you could take my opinion with a grain of salt, but like I, I could almost see things shifting that direction because, you know, with, with the newer generation, I mean, like over the past 20, almost 20 years, you know, I've seen a lot of gentrification happening in a lot of cities and I've seen a real resurgence of small business. You know, I think the youth of today really have a good grasp and a really solid appreciation of small business um, yeah. and art. And I can absolutely see things trending that way. Like the, the small mom and pop theaters come back. You know, but then, but then that begs the question, what happens to the tentpole films, you know, um, you know, the top guns and the Marvel movies and the DC movies and things like that. Like, it's just, it's just, I don't know. It's a weird time. You know, as yeah, I talked to you, it's, really it's a is. weird time. I mean, it, 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 it's a really weird time. And it's like, things have changed like more in the last three years than they probably in the whole last like decade. Like it just, it's just something like accelerated. I mean, my, my, my total business model has changed like, I want to say like half a dozen times in the last like two years, like, like what I was doing two years ago and doing now is di different. You know, the approach is different. The types of movies are different. You know, I mean, hell, I, I, I said uh, two years ago, I was never going to do another narrative feature. And, you know, here I am, you know, it, it's just it, thing, things change and they change rapidly. And I really about, I'd say about a year ago, like I was about, uh, you know, I was a good like year and a half into my YouTube journey. And I felt really confident that I like, I got it. I got this locked. Like I understand it. I understand the market. I know how to do this. I know how to tell other people how to do this. And I'm sitting here a year later and I'm kind of like, man, I, I, right now, I don't know. Like, I really don't know. You know, like I, the stuff that I was doing that was working isn't some of the stuff that wasn't working now is working. It's mm -hmm. like I like I really I all I can say here right now and say for sure is I I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, so what's what's giving you hope right now as a filmmaker? What are some things you're seeing happening that that encourage you and, and give you hope and, you know, are like, OK, yeah, you know, I think this is good. I think it's a good trend. Well, like I, I think, um, I think the switch over and streaming from reliance on uh, SVOD to AVOD, the front going from subscription based to ad based, I think is a really good thing for independent filmmakers. Like you know, because we're seeing it, we're, we're we're making more off ad video supported things like like Tubi TV than you know we were off Amazon, you know, with the subscription base, you know, before the rates got cut. Um, and, and and we're seeing and new ones are popping up like you know Voodoo just created one, um, Apple TV is now doing SVOD. Um, I, I I don't have any movies there on SVOD yet, but I, but I you know assume it'll be better. Um, Amazon opened up IMDb TV, which they're getting ready to rebrand because the name's so stupid. But that's ad video based, and I, and that pays better than what Amazon did. Um, so I think when the advertisers are, you know, shouldering those costs, I think, you know, the platforms can continue to grow. Like, it'll be real interesting to see what happens with Tubi because, you know, may, it, it'll either grow or it's in a bubble and <laughs> it'll burst. But I, I don't know for sure. But but it does. It's, you know, right now they're they're kind of the the uh, the great the great hope for independent film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've, I've been hearing, I didn't know a whole lot about that up until recently. Um, I, yeah. I, I've seen some buzz about the the whole ad based thing and it's kind of becoming the new trend for things. And it's interesting to see what's going to happen with that. And, and, and you know, I, I think that also, I wonder if that would open a new avenue for, um, uh, for independent filmmakers to get revenue or not, sorry, not to get revenue, but to get funding, you know, that maybe they could build partnerships or sponsorships with a company yeah. that, and then they could start funding their films. Yeah, totally. Well, and another another speaking of ad video based stuff is you know that that's what YouTube is. It, it is ad video based. No no different than Tubi TV except that it's a more generalized you know type of content. But what you're seeing now is all these uh, MCNs, multi or M MNCs, MCNs, multi channel national like whatever networks, multi channel networks. And there are these big conglomerations that put you know movies up on YouTube and then 
like that there's distributors now that are delivering their content to YouTube and they're making a lot of money. I mean, I talked with a distributor a few uh, weeks ago, who I, you know, I, I can't name, but you know, they, they did like $35,000 or something like that off of YouTube, you know, in a month. Wow. In Just month. off of ads? Off of ads. Yep. Wow. And, and well, even looking at my channel, like I have 7,000 subscribers, right? I have a pretty, you know, relatively low amount of subscribers. And, you know, I make anywhere from 200 to $1,500 a month on there, depending on what's going on, you know, and that's just on ads, you know, and, that, and that's just on, you know, mostly, you know, these short five to 30 minute videos, you know, and then occasionally I'll put a documentary up there and like, it, it'll do okay. But, do, uh, so as, as far as your, as far as your filmmaking goes, um, what is, what is your preferred genre of film to make? Um, I mean, honestly, I, I don't, I don't really have one. I, I, I like, I enjoy, I guess horror, like, cause I, I keep, I come back to it. I, I like mm -hmm. horror sets. I like dealing with the blood and the effects. Like, I like that yeah. stuff. I, I like the, uh, I like the heightened emotional stakes because it's like, like every movie should be at least in your character's mind, life or death. But like in horror movies, it's literally life or death. You know, and it's usually extreme circumstances that are sometimes, you know, impossible in real life. So, like, I, it's like that old, uh, that old quote uh, about, you know, like, you'll meet a person's true self when they're, like, in the middle of torture or something or, like, in an extreme situation. And mm -hmm. so, like, I, I like that about horror. That's a, that's a fantastic transition into the, this question here. What is it? And, and, and Harrison Smith and I talked about this um, on, on the first episode that I did. What is it? What is it you think? Um, what is it about horror that attracts people? What, what is it about that genre? Do you think that attracts people? Well, I, I honestly, I think it's uh, what, just what I said. I think it's like I think it's this this height. You can say what you want. Like people want to be scared, or people want to take the roller mm -hmm. coaster, or whatever. But I, I think it comes down to like viewing people reacting emotionally to these completely unreal situations or, mm -hmm. you know, really extreme situations. Uh, I, it's just, I think that can be really cathartic um, and, mm -hmm. and cool. You know, so I, I, I that, that's what I think it is. Are there, are there any genres out there that actually really scare you? Like what, what scares you? Like what, what movies actually scare you, make you feel fear? You mean like, 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 like a horror movie and scared mm -hmm. watching it? Um, to be uh, to be honest, no, nothing's really. And I think it's. I think you age out of that. I, I mean, there's some people do. I, I I just I think I aged out of it. You know, whereas you know, the, there's nothing fictitious that's gonna frighten me anymore. Yeah. Uh, the the last movie I remember being frightened at was uh, Candyman when it you know first came out and it was like ninety ninety eight or whenever that came out ninety six. That that's that's the last one I remember. Now. I've like, I've been like on the edge of my seat, like kind of in suspense on some things since, but like, I don't remember ever being like truly frightened by anything since, since mm -hmm. then. I, in fact, to this day, I've never said it uh, to a mirror like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, never. what's funny about that. I, I remember that as a kid and, um, and then actually meeting, I, I want to say, I actually did think about this um, meeting Tony Todd he he is the nicest human oh, yeah. being you could ever meet. He's so nice. You're just – and to this – I mean, like, it's a real testament to him as an actor because it's like how how can somebody so kind play right. such evil characters? I mean, he really does a great job portraying these characters. But he's For so sure. nice. I mean, he act, I mean, he knew me by name. He mm -hmm. – he, he, I, I, I was so impressed by him. I mean, he had this really long line of people at this convention, and I literally – he, he took time with every – single person. He didn't rush a single person off. I, I interact with him on Twitter a lot. And, and he, I mean, he knew me by name. He looked That's at me, great. goes, Brian, right. And I said, yeah. And, I mean, and it's a real testament to who he is as a human being as well. But I mean, it's, but it was just so funny kind of having that parallel, like meeting this man, they were kind of remembering as a kid. It's like, wow, I was so terrified to say candy man five mm -hmm. times in the mirror, you know, and there's the it's guy himself. And he's so nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we'll wrap it up anybody. here. Oh, go, go ahead, man. I'm sorry. I was going to say, I never met him, but I, I've heard similar things about Robert England uh, as well. Yeah, he, he, I've heard he's pretty nice too. I, I'd like to meet him one day. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up with a couple more questions. Um, okay. What, what three films do you think every filmmaker should watch? 
Um, I'd say Reservoir Dogs uh, one, and I don't even think Reservoir Dogs is Tarantino's best movie, but I think it's a really good one for filmmakers to watch because you know it's it's very uh, it's very like production wise, kind of low rent. It's pretty much a single location. It's few characters. It's really dialogue driven. There's not a lot of effects or action. You know, it's all character based, but it, it works really good. And it's a it really is a good masterclass in like how to use music. Like how to how to not use music, you know, a lot of it, you know, there's no traditional score in it whatsoever. Like how to make, you know, drama work without, you know, leaning on a score. Um, so that that one for sure. Um, and then just the acting. Um probably that's a good question. Um Evil Dead 2. Um, just to just to show you like how how inventive and exciting a movie can be even on a you know a tiny budget like mm -hmm. look at like look at how like dynamic the camera movement is there and like you know like they like the vaseline cam you know where they they couldn't afford a slider so they put vaseline on like a wood table and like slid the camera with it you know like stuff like that I mean, it's just it's so inventive and and it and it works you know so evil dead um uh maybe I actually maybe clerks and I and I'm actually I'm not a Kevin Smith fan but like just just show you how just like like it's not even very the actors aren't even very good but like the but it's the, the script is so well done and the characters are so engaging like it works mm -hmm. and it was a hit without without any like base level like filmmaking you know I mean you know it's it's not well shot you know, it's mm -hmm. it's it's not well visually directed. You know, um, it but it 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 freaking works. You know. So this this would be more of an obscure question, but like, what three books would you say every filmmaker should read? Um. So I I think if I think if you're a screenwriter, you should be reading a, a lot of you know fiction stuff just to see how it works. But you know for like like film filmmaking books, like I would say, Robert Rodriguez Rebel Without a Crew is a is it, it's inspirational and just don't use it as a roadmap because he was a lottery winner. But it is it's an inspirational mm -hmm. story and he, and he does talk a lot about making stuff work with nothing and he really did have nothing when he made that. You know, so I'd say that um, uh, directing actors, um, I forget the author's name, but it's a book about directing actors, but a lot of it also relates to screenwriting and that's really good. Um, and then uh, and Sid, Sid Field, no, not Sid Field, uh, Film Critics Hulk's uh, Screenwriting 101. Like that, that's, that is the best screenwriting book I've ever read, but it's also a really good uh, just uh, like storytelling thing. Have you ever read the book uh, Save the Cat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, were, what was your thoughts on it? Do you think it's a good one to read as well? I, I think it. I, so I, I'm of two minds on it. I think it's. I think it's good for people like me, like to where you're not taking it all for gospel. But I think if you take it for gospel and try to use it as a, like as a beat sheet to to make your screenplay, I think you're probably going to fail. I, I think it's I think any of the screenwriting books, I think they're good to read. It's like good to know, but don't necessarily follow it. Use it like a like a smorgasbord. Take what you want, leave the rest. But sure, just, just, just follow it. just blindly following it, you're just gonna write crap. But I think that there's some I mean, I, I still from time to time pull it out and I'll I'll look at the, my act breaks and kind of see like, am I following it? You know, and sometimes and sometimes I'll adjust, sometimes I won't. If you could make film in any decade, if you could time travel, where would you want to be a filmmaker right now? And make a film? Uh, honestly, no time better than now to actually make it. <laughs> I mean, if, if you'd give, you know, it's just, it's never been easier to make one. Although that said, you know, knowing everything, you could go back to the 90s and you could probably make something pretty awesome <laughs> if, you, if you could put together the money for it and do well in the market. But yeah, I think right now is the, easiest best time to make a quality project it's just a matter of making money with it now that that's the yeah. question because it, it's really not i mean the, the the phone i'm doing this call on is a better image quality than probably my first like three feature films 
you know, it just, just here, it's in my hand, you know? Yeah. That's just and, so incredible too, <laughs> to think about that. Yeah. I mean, I mean just, just what you can do on your phone. Dude, the, the setup that I use at home for my YouTube studio, you know, I have a little, I use a, uh, uh, black magic, uh, 6k and, uh, uh, like a audio technica shotgun mic. I think it's like 150 bucks for the mic, not even a super expensive mic and a zoom recorder. And that is, that is better quality sound and video than again, like first three or four movies, you know, and I was, you know, I was shooting on cinema cameras on some of that stuff or what was, what was cinema cameras then. It's, it's, well, it's crazy. So you bring that up. Let me ask you one more question. Um, mm -hmm. and so with, with, with making films, say independent films, you know, I, I, I've, I have learned that the standard is you want to shoot in 24 frames. Uh, you want to have your shutter speed at the, you know, the one forty eighth of a second. Um, do you think, uh, and, and, and use anamorphic as well. You know, I've learned that that's something you should do. Do you think that that's really something that's important today? Like, like, is that, is that really something to hold to? Or would you encourage people to not even worry about that and shoot at 30 frames at, you know, 4k or 1080p or. I mean, I'll, I won't say it's unimportant, but I'll say the most important things, like, honestly, like, like technically sound is more important than your visual and your story is more important than any of it. So like, I, like, like I find filmmakers focus way too much on like the, on their visuals and their gear. And I'm not mm -hmm. saying that it's not important, that it doesn't help, that it doesn't do this and this and that it's, it's, it's great. But like, I would much, you'd be much better off spending more time working with your actors or getting better actors or like that's, that's your production value. Good on an independent film, a good performance is worth way more money than a, than a $60,000 camera. For sure. If I had $60,000 and I could ensure good performances or shoot on my iPhone, I would shoot on my iPhone and do the good performances. No, no, no doubt. Story, story, performances, sound, visuals. That's my, my, you know, hierarchy, you know, and, and not a lot of DPs out there will say, ah, that's bullshit, but I, that, that's just my opinion. That's, that's fantastic. I, I cannot think of a better way to end it right there, man. That's, oh. that's solid. Cool. So Jason, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and um, I'll go ahead and kill recording. man. Thank you so much, man. I want to say thank you to each and every one of you for joining me on today's podcast. I had an absolute blast making it and I hope you had just as much fun listening to it. I want to take a moment to remind each and every one of you that you're awesome, that you matter, that you're loved. And I'm so glad that each and every one of you are here. I want to give special thanks to my producer and sound editor, Donovan Brown. And I want to once again say thank you to today's guest. That other interview show is a Dawn Journey production. Be sure to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And please also take a moment to like, subscribe, and leave us a review. It really does help us out. And that's it, folks. Until next time, stay tuned, stay curious, and as George Amiro used to always say, stay scared. <laughs>